Welcome to Space News from the Electric Universe, brought to you by the Thunderbolts Project at thunderbolts.info. In part one of this presentation, physicist Wal Thornhill began his analysis of one of the most significant space discoveries in recent memory. The history and origins of the gas giant Saturn, and indeed the entire solar system, including our own planet, is not what we've been told. Planetary scientists recently made the astonishing discovery that water in Saturn's satellites and rings is remarkably similar to water on Earth. As Thornhill explained, this discovery was explicitly predicted nearly three quarters of a century ago by the scientific heretic Dr. Emanuel Velikovsky. It was Velikovsky's claim that only a few thousand years ago, a period of chaos reigned in the solar system. One of the planets closely associated with Earth was Saturn and watery filaments rained on our planet following Saturn's violent flare-up. Decades later, based on the respective research of Dave Talbot and Eduardo Cardona, Thornhill developed his own model of a primordially close relationship between Earth and Saturn, which was the source of all the water in our oceans while leaving remnants in its rings. Today, Thornhill continues his presentation, shifting his focus to his own successful predictions for the Saturnian system including the mysterious moon, Titan. Before I tell the epic story, a warning. Our education systems train students to memorize a litany of facts, which produces global groupthink. Students are not given the time or encouragement to critically examine the history of ideas. A leading researcher into the learning functions of the divided brain, Dr. Ian McGilchrist, has shown such blinkered left hemisphere training render students functionally blind to alternative ways of looking at a problem. The left hemisphere simply blocks out everything that doesn't fit with its take. It doesn't see it, actually, at all. So scientists with their narrow specialised training may look at but cannot see what to a non-expert may seem obvious. They will be the last to see a paradigm shift in the making. This is particularly evident for electrical phenomena in space. Even the Nobel Prize winning founder of the idea of an electric universe, Hans Ophain, was ignored when he warned in his 1970 acceptance speech of an inevitable crisis in astrophysics if electric circuits in space are not recognised. Houston, we still have that problem after almost 50 years. I have lived since a teenager with uncertainty about accepted truths and learned to have the courage to challenge them. The result is not chaos, but a synthesis of ideas that explains the old ideas better and finds new ways of incorporating what seems a chaos of anomalies. And the best test is that of classical physics, simplification. The resulting paradigm shift is not a threat, but an invitation to the greatest adventure we may ever know, to begin to understand our real place in the universe for the first time. In our electric universe, stars and planets are formed at the same time inside molecular clouds, along a snaking cosmic lightning bolt. Gravity plays no role in the process. Since cosmic lightning takes the form of a twisted pair of current filaments, it is found that most stars are in pairs, or multiples. Planets will tend to do the same. Like the snaking filaments in a novelty plasma ball, the star-forming filament moves on, leaving a string of massive objects behind to gravitationally form the weird and theoretically challenging zoo of exoplanetary systems recently discovered. Some gas giant planets are subsequently formed in close orbits about a star that has ejected charged matter to achieve stability with a changed electrical environment. The ejection flares may account for the flickering of newborn stars, which can't be explained by gravitational accretion. This explains the unexpected hot Jupiter seen in large numbers closely orbiting other stars. The most numerous stars in the galaxy, brown dwarfs, which would appear reddish if they could be seen with the naked eye, are generally classed as failed stars, yet they have the baffling ability to produce massive stellar flares. This is simply explained because red stars don't have the ability of main sequence bright stars to control their current by a transistor-like action in their photospheric plasma. A brown dwarf can only respond by discharging matter electrically. 
The capture process of a brown dwarf star involves flaring and ejection of charged matter by that body in order to achieve a new electrical equilibrium in its adopted family. That accounts for the large number of close-orbiting moons of our captured gas giants in remote orbits. With this in mind, I want to take you back to just before the famous Cassini-Huygens space probe was to arrive at Saturn on July 1, 2004. In news reports, Saturn was dubbed the original Lord of the Rings. There is a profound truth behind such a glib turn of phrase, but it wasn't until the advent of the telescope that Christian Huygens, in 1656, was able to suggest that Saturn had a ring. So how do we explain the Saturnian ring symbolism that pervades our cultures? The halo of the saints, the royal crown, and the ring given in marriage are Saturnian symbols, as are the circled or Celtic cross, the Egyptian ansate cross or ankh, the eye of Ra, and the astronomically baffling star inside the crescent. The star at the top of the lighted Christmas tree is pure Saturnian imagery, it is truly amazing that we are still haunted by prehistoric archetypes. It helps us to understand the extraordinary archetypal attraction of Tolkien's fantasy of Lord of the Rings. He was well versed in mythology. The following description of events is based on the surprisingly detailed and truly remarkable scholarship of Talbot and Cardona, which required explanations with the physics of an electric universe. Let's call our primordial star Proto-Saturn. It was an independent brown dwarf with its own entourage of satellites, including the Earth, Mars and Titan. Proto-Saturn's dim reddish light was due to a glowing red anode plasma sheath, much larger than the Sun, enclosing Proto-Saturn and its inner satellites in a radiant cell. The term dwarf star is purely theoretical, since they are difficult to see and measure. In fact, NASA reported a brown dwarf which was radiating as if it had twice the expected surface area. The environment inside the radiant red shell is most hospitable for life on any enclosed satellites because there are no seasons and water is conspicuous in the spectra of such stars. Water misted down on this planet continually and red light is ideal for photosynthesis which explains the abundance of ferns and other vegetation globally in the Carboniferous era. But there is a catch. Brown dwarf stars are known to flare, sometimes to the extent, as one astronomer commented, that any satellites would suffer a very bad day. Such flaring by Proto-Saturn accounts for the geological strata and the fossil record of a number of global mass extinctions and instant burial of dismembered plant and animal remains. As we approached the sun from deep space, our plasma sheath flickered like a faulty electric light when the two stellar plasma sheaths, or magnetospheres, began to clash. Proto-Saturn's galactic electrical power was usurped by the sun, and its appearance changed dramatically. Before dimming forever, the dwarf star Proto-Saturn would have flared brilliantly like a comet ejecting charged matter to relieve the electrical stresses caused by the sudden change in environment. Even now the former star has not completely cooled. Saturn still radiates more than twice the heat it receives from the Sun. And we have a simple explanation for the origin of Saturn's mysteriously short-lived water ice rings. As the proto-Saturnian system approached the Sun in the outer solar system, our minor star's gravitational sphere of influence steadily shrank and its outer satellites were progressively stripped away. This and the earlier capture of the other gas giants provides the source of trans-Neptunian objects as they're known, including Pluto with its unexpected geology and atmosphere and its peculiar moons. There is a simple physical characteristic that links a captured star with its offspring. It is the axial tilts, like our close orbiting moon, satellites tend to orbit their primary with the same face always turned toward it. If they orbit in the equatorial plane, their spin axis will be aligned with that of the primary. As gyroscopes, the satellites will retain the same tilt even if jolted from their orbit, although the process may induce a wobble of the spin axis. It is therefore highly significant that the two key planets identified in the ancient pantheons 
Saturn and Mars have axial tilts closely similar to that of the Earth. The tilt of Saturn at 27 degrees to the ecliptic plane is itself an enigma, unless it formed independently from the Sun. Venus was described as a spectacular discharging body in the ancient congregation of planets. It can be explained if Venus was ejected in the flare-up of proto-Saturn and the infall of the stream of ejected matter from swiftly rotating proto-Saturn gave Venus a slow retrograde spin. The magnitude of the axial tilt of Venus to the ecliptic is much less than Saturn's, which suggests that Venus was ejected from a low latitude. This accounts for the hellish temperature and new surface of Venus, having been recently spat from the mantle of a brown dwarf star. Its filamentary equatorial scars caused by spectacular radial discharging and its thick atmosphere inherited from the brown dwarf and subsequently modified by interplanetary and cometary discharges. Venus still has a cometary magnetotail stretching to the Earth's orbit, and its mountaintops glow with plasma discharges, which return Magellan's radar signals as unexplained shininess. Magellan's radar also showed Venus has a surprisingly young surface that gave rise to ad hoc theories of resurfacing events. They're unnecessary. Venus is a baby. Since my predictions were written in 2004, the electrogravity model has been further developed and it explains electrogravitational capture and the rounding of cometary orbits by electrical discharge. It explains the huge capture cross-section of stars and why the observed phenomenal discharging of cometary Venus caused it to finally have the most circular orbit of any planet. The Electric Universe conceptual model can claim a number of successful predictions. Significantly, it was the only model to predict the surface features of smog-shrouded Titan before the Huygens probe revealed them in detail. Titan, which is 50% larger than our Moon, is an enigma for astronomers, having a global orange haze that has prevented us from seeing surface features. It has a massive atmosphere, mainly of nitrogen, with a pressure at the surface like that at the bottom of a swimming pool. The atmosphere also contains methane and at least nine other organic molecules. The methane is being continually destroyed by solar radiation, which raises a further problem about its source of resupply if the moon is 4.6 billion years old. This has led to widespread speculations of Titan possibly being covered by an approximately one kilometre deep ocean of liquid ethane. However, radar, infrared and radio observations of Titan have not found signs of a hydrocarbon ocean. In fact, one radar return was of a type that we would expect to get back from Venus. But Titan is not 4.6 billion years old and the Earth did not form where we find it today. Instead, Saturn's largest moon Titan is a child of Saturn and a sibling of Venus, Earth and Mars. I wrote just before Cassini arrived at Saturn we should be alert to similarities between Titan and Venus. On November 29, 2006, the Dallas Morning News reported, when the $3 billion Cassini spacecraft sailed past Titan three weeks ago, it was supposed to clear up many of the mysteries about Saturn's largest moon. Instead, it has left scientists more befuddled. The new Cassini images do not support previous theories about Saturn's moon. In New Scientist of November 6, 2004, Titan images add to Moon's mystery, Stephen Battersby reported. The world got its first peek at the surface of Saturn's moon Titan last week. The images were taken as NASA's Cassini Huygens spacecraft swept past the moon. The images show a landscape that is clearly still being shaped. Although Titan must have suffered numerous meteor impacts in the past, its surface today is largely crater-free. Somehow these scars must have been eroded or filled in. We are seeing a place that is alive, geologically speaking, says Charles Ilaki, head of the team running Cassini's radar instrument. I commented at the time, that is precisely what was said about Venus when the Magellan orbiter revealed that planet's surface. It is only supposition that Titan's surface is still being shaped. It's based on the belief that Titan must have suffered numerous meteor impacts in the past 
and therefore something must have occurred from within the moon to fill the craters. However, like Venus, there may have been no impact craters to fill. For that matter, no one has witnessed a large crater forming meteor impact. The report continued. Suggestions of an active dynamic surface on Titan are beginning to emerge. Not a single crater has been identified yet, which means the surface must be young and active. One large circular feature, suspected of being a crater until closer examination showed it to be flat, closely resembles the pancake domes seen on Venus that are produced by magma welling up to produce a bubble that then slumps down to a nearly flat profile. Other features resemble the lobes of some surface lava flows. We don't understand what we're looking at. Titan is going to be a real challenge. My comment was, the surprise about the lack of craters and Titan's apparent active dynamic surface mirrors the comments made about Venus when radar images were first returned. The large, flat, circular feature on Titan does resemble the pancake dome seen on Venus. However, these domes were not formed by volcanic action. It would require an unacceptably large number of coincidences to produce such circularity in just one of these domes. The surface must be absolutely horizontal and the flow from the central vent must be perfectly even in all horizontal directions. But there are many domes on Venus. In the Electric Universe model, the domes are more simply explained as the raised blisters sometimes caused by lightning. Small-scale circular raised blisters have been found following a negative cloud-to-ground lightning strike to a lightning conductor cap. They're called fulgamites. A test of this hypothesis would be to determine if the surface around these domes is sunken. Fulgamites show this characteristic burrow pit effect where the material has been drawn inwards and upwards by the intense discharge to form the raised blister. It is not something to be expected from a volcanic upwelling. Inexplicably, in terms of the volcanic model, where two domes overlap, the relief of the underlying dome doesn't disturb the overriding dome. This, and the chain formation seen above, is typical of electrical scarring in general, where one crater is often centred on the rim of another, with little disturbance of the existing crater. With fulgamites, one mound often occurs on top of another as a result of multiple strokes within the lightning flash. So it seems that the images of Titan's surface returned by Cassini so far are predictable based on forensic evidence that we should be alert to similarities between Titan and Venus. This brings us to the other major puzzle about Titan, its atmosphere. Titan's atmosphere is believed by many scientists to be similar to Earth's early atmosphere, billions of years ago. Toby Owens, principal scientist at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, said, What we've got is a very primitive atmosphere that has been preserved for 4.6 billion years. Titan gives us the chance for cosmic time travel, going back to the very earliest days of Earth when it had a similar atmosphere. From New Scientist, November 6, Titan appears to have lost much of its original atmosphere. The Moon has an unusually high abundance of nitrogen-15, compared with the lighter isotope, nitrogen-14. That could be explained if most of the atmosphere had evaporated into space a process in which the nitrogen-14 would have escaped more easily than nitrogen-15. What could cause such a loss is unknown, but it would mean that Titan once had an atmosphere 40 times as thick as Earth's, making it a dwarf version of a gas planet. This bizarre world may be far more complex than we have begun to imagine, says Larry Soderblom of the US Geological Survey in Flagstaff, Arizona. My comment was... Titan's atmosphere is primitive, but not in the sense that it remains 4.6 billion years old. Instead, there has not been time for young Titan to lose much atmosphere. If Titan, like Venus, is a young, recently ejected body, it may still be cooling from its natal heat. And, like Venus, it has a super-rotating wind. The striking disparity in nitrogen isotopes is telling us something about the way planetary atmospheres are formed rather than how they evolve. There are several processes during birth in an electrical discharge that will have significant effects on planetary atmospheres, including that of Titan. The primary effect comes from the source and depth of the ejection from the flaring parent dwarf star or gas giant.
The chemical elements in the discharge are then sorted according to their critical ionisation velocity. Also, isotopes will tend to separate in the magnetic field of the plasma discharge. Lastly, the plasma gun effect, seen now ejecting material from Io so-called volcanoes into space, is known in the laboratory to be a copious source of neutrons. The neutrons may be captured to form heavy isotopes and radioactive elements. The variable combination of all these effects suggests that it would be unlikely for any two bodies in the same family to have identical initial atmospheres. Subsequent electrical interactions between planets and moons would also serve to transfer surface materials and atmospheres, transmute elements and further complicate the picture. That fits generally with the irregular elemental and isotopic signatures found in the atmospheres of our planetary system. For example, nitrogen in lunar soils is ten times more abundant than one may expect from the concentrations of solar wind rare gases. There are some other mechanisms that could also contribute to the lack of nitrogen-14 in Titan's atmosphere. For example, nitrogen-14 can capture an electron to become carbon-14. Carbon-14 decays by very weak beta decay back to nitrogen-14 with a half-life of approximately 5,730 years. If the age of Titan's atmosphere can be measured in tens or hundreds of thousands of years instead of billions, then a significant amount of nitrogen-14 may still be locked up as carbon-14, contributing perhaps to the hydrocarbons in Titan's atmosphere and on its surface. To suggest Titan once had an atmosphere 40 times as thick as Earth's, making it a dwarf version of a gas planet, only complicates the plainly impossible standard model of formation of the solar system. Why don't other large moons in the outer solar system have substantial residual atmospheres? It seems far more plausible to suggest that Titan is a much newer moon than Jupiter's Ganymede or Callisto. Titan simply hasn't had time to lose its heavy atmosphere, just as Saturn hasn't had time to lose its rings following its last discharge. In this picture, we now have the key to understanding what shapes Titan's landscape, said Dr. Martin Tomasco, principal investigator for the Descent Imager Spectral Radiometer, adding... Geological evidence for precipitation, erosion, mechanical abrasion and other fluvial activity says that the physical processes shaping Titan are much the same as those shaping Earth. These comments demonstrate the problem of interpretation when the model is geocentric. Methane is a non-polar molecule which doesn't form clouds and rain like electrically polarised water molecules do. So precipitation, erosion and other fluvial activity will not occur much the same as those shaping Earth. Finally, returning to Venus, why is its atmosphere so different to the other planets and Titan? The atmosphere of Venus is mostly carbon dioxide, 96.5% by volume. Most of the remaining 3.5% is nitrogen. This inhospitable mix is accompanied by clouds of sulfuric acid. I explained in my 2004 article Venus probably began with an atmosphere more like Titan's and the Earth's, where nitrogen dominates and with more water. On the Venusian surface, nitrogen molecules require very little energy to transmute to carbon monoxide molecules by a catalytic surface nuclear reaction in the presence of red-hot iron. The brilliant French chemist Louis Curvin, when investigating carbon monoxide poisoning of welders, discovered this surprising transmutation. The carbon monoxide then reacts at the host surface of Venus with water vapour to form carbon dioxide and hydrogen in a well-known industrial process. The hydrogen produced escapes from Venus. This process explains the puzzling discovery made by Venus landers that the water vapour concentration diminished as they approached the Venusian surface. But decisively, it explains the heavy carbon dioxide atmosphere and little remaining nitrogen on Venus. It also explains the steady stream of hydrogen escaping from the top of Venus's atmosphere at present and the phenomenally high proportion, 120 times that on Earth, of heavy hydrogen, or deuterium, left behind in its atmosphere. What I've attempted to show here is a coherent story using forensic evidence stretching back into prehistory of celestial events involving planets and their electrical thunderbolt interactions. 
a new picture of the universe results from paying heed to Alfane's warning to introduce electric universe science into cosmology. This is a fundamental shift from the ad hoc theoretical approach, which has no theory explaining the force of gravity, and so, unsurprisingly, no success trying to introduce order into a chaos of anomalies. It has no chance of ever discovering that we are children of the planet and former brown dwarf star, Saturn. This is an invitation to the greatest adventure, to begin to understand our real history and place in the universe for the first time, and that must bring about a much-needed cultural change that may dwarf the scientific revolution. That change is essential if we are to have a future, because the post-traumatic stress disorder we have inherited threatens our very existence on this planet. It manifests as a desire not to know the shocking truth because it exposes our existential fears. As Roger Westcott ably expressed it, Man is a wounded animal. His survival is astonishing, but his inability to heal his wounds is tragic. It is tragic because, as Velikovsky argued, being descendants of the survivors of great paroxysms of nature of the past, we are possessed by the urge inherited through racial memory to repeat the violent performance. And it was his greatest fear that we now had the destructive capability to produce our own doomsday. Along with that genius Carl Jung, he warned that mankind is his own worst enemy. So the cultural change offered by Electric Universe cosmology is essential for our survival. By offering a real understanding of the universe and our history, it offers hope and inspiration where presently there is none. There is far more to life in the Electric Universe than is dreamt of presently. We are all intimately connected with each other and the Earth. Enjoy the Saturnian Festival of Lights and the New Year.